Education now seems to me perhaps the most authoritarian and dangerous of all social inventions of mankind. It is the deepest foundation of the modern slave state, in which most people feel themselves to be nothing but producers, consumers, spectators and fans, driven more and more in all parts of their lives by greed, envy and fear. My concern is not to improve education, but to do away with it, to end the ugly and anti-human business of people shaping, and to allow and help people to shape themselves. John Holt, 1976. My name's Jake. Welcome to The Voluntary Life. This is the first in a series of episodes on the subject of unschooling. I understand unschooling to mean allowing children to learn in a self-directed way by doing. It is an approach to, to learning which is child-centered, um, which is child-led, and which very much um, continues the process of learning that begins at birth, whereby children's natural curiosity and interest lead them to want to find out, want to learn things, as opposed to the idea of any kind of compulsory curriculum or schooling or education, whether that be in a, an official school environment of lessons or a home school environment with following you know, a curriculum of, of, uh, of some kind or another. It's a very radical idea, um, one that was completely new to me until quite recently, and I think it's important to acknowledge that it is an approach that presents some really significant challenges in implementing it, both practical and emotional challenges. And I would also like to acknowledge that we haven't had kids yet, so my interest in this approach is also prior to actually implementing it. I'm sure that if we do have kids, and we do plan to unschool them if we do, that there will be a lot of uh, significant challenges that, uh, that we'll encounter. However, for me, what's so exciting about this approach is that it strikes me as being the most respectful and supportive and nurturing way of helping uh, children learn and helping yourself to learn. And as we talk about in the discussion in this episode, I think it's also the most consistent way of applying the principles of voluntarism to the question of raising children. And so I'm really excited about this approach. It's something that made a profound effect on me when I first read about it, and I hope you find it interesting too. In this first episode, we're going to be talking about one of the books that really founded the unschooling movement. Uh, the book is Instead of Education by John Holt, uh, the author of the quote at the beginning of this podcast. And the special guests on this discussion are Brett Vinot, who is the host of the School Sucks podcast, and Stefan Molyneux, who is the host of Free Domain Radio. In part two, in the next episode, we will talk about the school system and the experience of compulsory schooling, the role of teachers, the psychological impact of compulsory schooling, and ways of surviving it. And in part three, we'll hear from people who are unschooling their own children and applying these principles within their own families. We'll also talk about some of the barriers to unschooling and some ways that we might overcome them. But instead of education, the book we're talking about in this episode is really a good introduction to these ideas and provides a foundation for the whole subject of unschooling. So I hope you enjoy the discussion. Thank you so much for listening. And on to part one. Thanks so much for coming along and welcome to the, to the Freedom Book Club. We're going to talk about uh, Instead of Education by John Holt. And um, I'm really glad that uh, Brett from School Sucks podcast has been able to make it. It's great to have you on, Brett. Well, thanks for inviting me, Jake. Appreciate <laughs> it. I wanted to start by um, asking you a question about this book, actually, because I know obviously you're, you, you have a, a background in, in education and have thought a lot about these, these issues. And, and I, I really loved this book. I thought it was amazing. I, I, hadn't, I hadn't heard of um, John Holt until recently. Um, and I'm, my question really just to, to start was that I understand that this was actually, you know, in the sort of 70s and, and early 80s, that he was kind of a quite a well-known guy and that the whole idea 
of alternatives to um, compulsory schooling was at least, you know, not a completely marginal topic. It had kind of, it was around in the culture and people were sort of talking about it. And I guess my question is, is that right? And, and what happened to the idea and the movement? Because obviously, uh, I know there's been a, maybe a bit of a resurgence more recently, but um, it seems to, to have been around in the 70s and early 80s and then sort of just, just kind of got lost, uh, it, from, at least from more mainstream debates. And do you, do you, could you say anything about, uh, about that? Yeah, uh, and I hate to start on a negative note, but that's one of the things that I think is particularly sad. Uh, you know, somebody like John Holt, his body of work has been, you know, so influential in, in my development, my understanding of, of educational issues and, of course, of compulsory schooling uh, in the United States and beyond. Um, but the, the impact of his amazing body of work on mainstream thinking uh, is nil. You know, I mean, he did he did get into um, uh, the spotlight in the 1970s and certainly, uh, of course, within, uh, you know, the circles where educational reform or educational issues is discussed. Most people are familiar with his name, but all of his work. You know, and think about how influential how children learn, why, or why children, or how children learn, why children fail. This book and a couple others, uh, it really didn't impact the institution of compulsory education uh, at all. You know, despite all of his risks, his insight, his his honesty, it did not change conventional schooling one bit. What it did do. Uh, and this was ultimately Holt's conclusion after he spent, I think, most of the uh, – when he left teaching, he taught in the 50s, and then I think he, he became more of a voice in the 1960s and in 70s. His ultimate conclusion was that the system could not be reform, uh, reformed. I think he spent a good chunk of his career as a speaker and an author saying that um, there, there was hope for the actual system. But he ultimately uh, rejected that idea. And his, his later works, this book included, eventually catapulted interest in homeschooling and, of course, the concept of unschooling. But as we all know, institutional schooling in the United States uh, and beyond has only gotten worse uh, since he died uh, roughly 25 years ago. So is that, is that an answer? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I was, I was, you mentioned that he, you know, sort of spent most of his career, as far as I understand, sort of trying to reform schooling and education. And I, I always thought it was pretty impressive that um, in this book, he, this is obviously towards the end of his, of his career and when he had basically given up. And I thought it was pretty mm -hmm. impressive that he, he had the guts to admit that, you know, um, he'd changed his mind and that it didn't work. And that he was sort of then putting forward um, a, a different approach, which, which was, um, as the title says, you know, instead of education, actually alternatives to the whole idea of sort of schooling itself. Um, and I, right. so I think it was really uh, admirable that, um, that he was sort of uh, willing to, um, relatively late on in his life, to have quite a change of heart for somebody who who was um, well inside the system, so to speak. But um, I guess, you know, why do you think it is that, um, the, do you think it's just the, the sort of the fact that the, the state, you know, uses, obviously uses force to, to, um, to enforce schooling, that this has stayed so marginal? I mean, like, what do you think the reasons are that people don't know about this book and, and that he sort of disappeared from the landscape? Well, I, I think that, you know, you're allowed to participate in, in a discussion about education if you're talking about reform. As soon as you switch or as soon as your position evolves to the idea of getting rid of uh, institutionalized public or compulsory schooling, uh, you, are, you are marginalized. Because what the, the conflict ultimately wound up being was Holt taking this position of educational freedom you know, for the benefit, for the enrichment, the development, the ultimate um, well-being of the learner, well, that put him uh, at odds with uh, people who were extolling the virtues of the, of the government education system or even, you know, institutionalized schooling in general uh, for the purpose of discipline, for the benefit 
ease and comfort of the, uh, the authorities. So when, when people think about what schooling is, and, and one thing that um, I think right in the beginning of this book, and you guys will have to excuse me, I, I, I read this book a while ago, but right in the first chapter, he you know, is very clear that we do not want to make this system more effective or efficient because its goal is not education. So while I would say, and I think Holt might even uh, would have agreed with me, that public education is the most effective and successful government program ever, if you look at what uh, the real goals you know, stated by people like Dewey and Horace Mann and the Rockefeller Board of Education, if you look at what they were really trying to do to use this system as a mold, uh, in a variety of different interest groups coming together to say, yes, we can get rid of Catholics and, we, you know, we, uh, all, all these different um, ideas that people had for how this system of control could be used on the minds of children. We don't want to make education more effective or efficient because that would only ultimately mean more damage to uh, young people. Right, right. Oh, I, I, I get what you, what, I think I understand sort of the, how this worked then. So basically Holt became famous whilst he was still talking about reform. And that was sort of, even if they were sort of, sort of radical ideas in terms of, of teaching style and so forth, as long as it was within the context of school um, and a sort of compulsory education system, then he was, if you like, acceptable as, as, a, as a kind of debate. But when in the end of his career, he went off over to educational freedom, then he basically got completely marginalized and, and forgotten because he obviously at that point was no longer um, talking about things that were, um, that were acceptable within um, the, the state education framework. Yeah, I mean, I, and that's true with any debate that we have in society, whether it relates to economics or, or politics or education or any other uh, issue. You know, you're welcome to participate in the debate as long as you're hacking at the leaves and the branches of the tree. But if you jump down and start and start really hammering away at the root, uh, you're out, you're marginalized, and uh, you have uh, taken on a position that is unacceptable and outrageous. So right. I... I I'm not an expert. I'm not. Uh, I'm obviously not a, a biographer of Holt, but that's the that's my my sense is that he was more accepted as an educational reformer than he was as a proponent of something like unschooling. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, I think um, and I think in terms of his um, his biography, I also don't know um, a huge amount about it, but. As far as I understand, the interesting, he's an interesting character because he wasn't a libertarian. I mean, he wasn't an anarchist in his, um, in his political outlook. And his advocacy of freedom from compulsory education seems to have been something he came to quite late in life. But I don't, at least as far as I understand, it wasn't from a sort of principled, you know, looking at voluntarism and then applying it within the education field, so to speak. It was more... He came to it from thinking about children and their well-being and that that was sort of what led him, I guess he was able to sort of follow through to the logical conclusions of, of, of that. But I don't, as far as I understand, he wasn't even, you know, particularly involved in the sort of wider issues of, of political uh, freedom and, and voluntarism. Uh well, I think what the, the only word that they probably had during most of, uh, most of Holt's career to use was libertarian. And obviously today we recognize that that's kind of bastardized and doesn't even really mean anything. But yeah. uh, I've said in the past that, you know, there are few people, the only person that I can really think of off the top of my head that did more for uh, libertarian ideas without ever really calling themselves a libertarian or, or recognizing their ideas as um, philosophically libertarian, would probably have to be Rand. And uh, she hated libertarians, by, by right, the way. But right. um, I, I think towards the end, maybe because there was a, a sort of burgeoning libertarian movement in the, in the 1970s that maybe Holt did warm up to that term, but I don't think he ever called himself a, a libertarian or considered himself uh, a libertarian, but certainly did a lot for... Um, you know, that, that philosophy, yeah. uh, because I think we recognize and, you know, I think 
two, looking at a, at a show or a body of work like Steps or, or Free Domain Radio, we, we see how, the, how dependent the state is, how dependent all of these authoritarian and, uh, you know, domination systems are on the way that uh, children are raised and that children are treated and that children are educated. And if there was a, uh, a, a serious reevaluation of, uh, you know, early childhood and adolescence and how people um, should be raised or what education really means, well, the state wouldn't make any sense anymore. If, if young people were treated with respect, that would be, that would be it. So in that sense, Holt's work is incredibly important, but you're right. He isn't pulled together with all of the people who are considered uh, voluntarist or, or libertarian thinkers. Right. And you could argue that in some senses, you know, the fact that his ideas are sort of consistently, um, well, consistently pro-freedom and, and, and not coercive is far more important than whether or not he actually called himself a libertarian or, or you know, had any labels. Because the fact is that he, as you say, he, he, uh, he really had, um, uh, at least in this book, I haven't read anything else of this, but I was just really impressed in this book at, at the um, sort of consistency and, and, uh, and the rationality of his, his approach. Right, yes, I, he is very consistent. And I wanted to just say, I mean, one of the things that, that really impressed me about this book is that he, he, he starts off by making a distinction which, for me, just blows a lot of discussions that are dead ends, completely out of the water, because he, he starts off by being very clear that the difference in sort of education... For him, like the the single difference that really matters is not whether or not a school is nice or whether it has a good pool and nice gym facilities and it's got lots of musical instruments for the kids to play or whether they have time to you know wander around the the um, the school grounds or whatever. It doesn't n- none of that for him is actually the distinctive thing that matters for him. The key difference is between whether or not you are there compulsorily, whether or not it's what he calls like a big, a capital S school, or whether or not it's a place of learning where you've chosen voluntarily to go, like, you know, a language centre or even just a friend who happens to know how to do something that you don't know. And, And that, I mean, it just makes perfect sense that that psychological difference of whether or not children are being told... In, in not necessarily in direct verbal terms, but but are being told by the circumstances that you know you will you will be forced to stay somewhere whether you like it or not, and you will be forced to adopt these ideas or at least parrot them back. Um, that that sort of it doesn't it just doesn't matter how nice the school is. That itself is such a um, an undermining idea for someone's selfhood. And their, you know, and their development that it really hasn't hasn't got anything to do with learning. And he goes on to talk about the relationship with, you know, the Milgram experiments and people's deep sort of sense of uh, of uh, authority that comes from, um, well, in his view, schooling, but obviously from our view, probably parenting as well. But I just thought that was a really nice distinction to, you know, to to draw between not between the sort of quality of the school. Um, but the actual psychological message that the child is either being coerced into doing something or they're not. Right, absolutely. And I, I have one of his quotes here. My concern is not to improve education, but to do away with it, to end the ugly and anti-human business of people shaping and to allow uh, and help people to shape themselves. And we think about what a foreign concept that is. Uh, and uh, to most people, when, when you talk about this idea of doing away uh, with, with these compulsory systems, it really shows the impact of the system on um, the constraints it puts on the thinking of most victims. I, I think that the, the, you know, the, the, um, the important theme in this book is education versus, or, or what's traditionally been defined as education, which he does the all-important job of redefining um, traditional education versus doing is just such a paradigm shift of letting young people explore and do. And um, the, whenever I've had these conversations in the past with people, they say, well, how, how will, if, if there's not school, how will they start learning uh, when they're six? 
You know, why is why is that deemed mandatory? Right. Uh, what's stopping, uh, you know, stop preventing people from doing, stop trapping people, stop uh, crippling curiosity by by interfering with their ability to act on it in school use. It's still so. So all of that curiosity um, and all of that, that intrinsic motivation is just crushed. There's nowhere for it to go. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the psychological impact um, you know, if I'm following what you said correctly, the psychological impact of that is, is tragic, devastating. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that I noticed about this book is that um, it, it's a wonderfully optimistic and really positive and really well-argued sort of case for uh, intrinsic motivation and getting just uh, learning by doing, by just getting on with life, basically. And I found that really uplifting and really uh, helpful and constructive in terms of thinking about, you know, um, if, if we have kids in the future, you know, what, what we'll do in terms of uh, helping them just get on with it, basically. At the same time, it's interesting, though, because I also I know what you mean. Looking at this book, you, you realize, bloody hell, I've been in prison for so long. You know, I was I was I was in effectively a prison. And I intellectually sort of understood that from the libertarian ideas anyway. But but this book really hammers it home because it, it really sort of makes it clear just just how how prison like compulsory schooling is and, and what that is about. I liked the way that he um, uh, he used the materials after the conflict when he was talking about that woman who came up and said, you know, it's it's destructive for you to to intimate that power warps the teacher student relationship. And he sort of let her around for about 10 minutes and then said, well, you know, would there other people in your school have power over you? And she said, well, yeah, of course. And he said, well, would you speak to them in this way? Uh, in the way that you're speaking to me, and she said no. I, I really like that sort of. Yeah, that was awesome. Argument. That was such yeah. an awesome comparison. Because yeah, I mean, the, the the temptation is so much to go into abstracts, and the value is so much to deal with the materials of the immediate. Absolutely. Now, his distinction between cap school and low cap school was pretty much the difference between compulsion. He, he didn't, I don't think he spelt it out. At least I didn't find a place where he spelt it out really explicitly. And I'm sorry if I'm joining late, but uh, just this has been discussed. But I got the sense that he's really talking about the difference between violence and voluntarism, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's just... that seemed to be his major distinction, right? That nobody was forced to be there, that the school wasn't banning anybody else from doing stuff or whatever. Exactly. And we were just talking about, you know, the, the, one of the things that what really impressed me is that that as, as the key distinction, you know, takes a lot of um, sort of peripheral things out, the, out of uh, out of the it stops you getting distracted by a lot of peripheral things. And it's not about how good the facilities are or how good, um, you know, the, uh, the music department is or whatever. It, the key thing that he's focused on is, is, is it coercive or not? And once that if it's coercive then, you know, in a sense, doesn't matter how, how nice it looks, you can't get beyond the poisonous message that that coercive nature actually um, prints on the child's, on the child's experience. And um, I thought that was really powerful because it, it, it means, you know, it's a, it's a really good principle to, to be able to evaluate, you know, what the experience is going to be like um, for, for the person who's actually going to go through it for the kids. And that's the frustrating thing, at least the frustrating thing that I found in the book, was that because he's not, he's not a philosopher, so he's not going to extract the principle from what bothers him in the moment and universalize it and take on society from that standpoint. So he's going to say, well, I don't like compulsion and bribery and threats for kids in school. And, you know, who's going to disagree with that? I mean, I think everybody's going to say that. Most people will say that's a good thing. But that also was not an uncommon view in the hippy-dippy era, you know, not to sound dismissive, but in the hippy-dippy era that he was writing, there was a lot of sort of free love and peace and let's not shower or whatever that was going on in the 1960s, which is, I guess, when this guy was emerging as a, as a writer. But the lack of, of capacity to extract that uh, in, in generalize it as a principle uh, is, is always, to me, kind of frustrating. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why his movement, you know, he says, we're probably going to have it for another generation. It's like, oh, if only that had been true, right? And so there's, I think it's important to look at what's, uh, what's not there and, and, and hopefully learn from it. 
And I think, too, if you look at the, the larger picture of his career, and he weaves this idea pretty consistently through a lot of his work and a lot of his books, but it, it is very much a, a practical argument. He, I believe he worked with younger kids, like elementary school uh, kids, when he was a teacher. And he was very firm and very consistent that children don't need to be coerced into learning. Young people want to learn. They just need the freedom. They just need, uh, you just need to be able to let that, that curiosity go and don't try to trap it in a, in a desk. So, yeah, you're right. He ne there was no, um, you know, abstracting that to the larger picture. It was very practical. He, he said this is, this is not the best way for young people to learn with coercion. Uh, and that, from, what I, from what I have seen of his work, that's as far as he ever took it. He did not say that, that the initiation of force is, is wrong in this uh, occurrence and all others. He was talking about it from you know, a practical standpoint, that this is not the best way for young people to learn to be coerced in, into learning. You Which, mean, of course, brings, sorry, bring, that brings up the question of best for whom, right? It certainly is better for the state if children are, are coerced into, quote, learning. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. From the so this is, that's the argument from effect problem, which is like, well, okay, best or worst for who? But I think he, he definitely got that, that the, that the status quo in education serves the power structures that exist. I think that was, I mean, unless I misread it, I, th I thought that was fairly clear. No, I think he did, he did get that. But, yeah, I guess, Brett, I, I can see what you mean. If he came at this from a sort of being a teacher at the coalface type of um, approach that he was interested in effects. He was interested in what would be the best way to facilitate learning. And so his argument then sort of grew out of, you know, coercion just doesn't work, um, as opposed to being a more universal coercion is wrong in all cases and including in education. And therefore, you know, that, it, it following from that. But I still think that it's remarkably, we were just talking, Steph, earlier, that, you know, he didn't, obviously didn't call himself a libertarian, this guy. And we don't know quite how much contact he had with wide, or, or, or an anarchist or an anarcho-capitalist, whatever. We don't know how much contact he had with, with the sort of people, few people who were around in those days. But, um, but, you know, even though he didn't call himself that and probably didn't think in terms of wider... Um, wider ideas of, of um, non-coercion and the non-aggression principle, he still applies it pretty consistently, you know, if, if, even if it's not sort of understood, he still applies it pretty consistently in this particular field, just in terms of, of, of talking about education. And um, I think that's, you know, in terms of everything that I've read, this is uh, 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 the most consistent thing I, I've read on, on uh, sort of, you know, from a sort of teaching or education perspective about uh, applying the non-aggression non principle. I didn't get to the last few chapters, which I apologize, so I'll keep this question brief in case you dealt with it, but um, does, does he talk much about parenting? I don't remember him talking that much about parenting. Um, like, one of the things I did notice is that he, he references the obedience of people in society, the Milgram experiments and so forth, and he very much says, well, this is, you know, it's not surprising because they've been in prison all these years, they've been at, at comp in compulsory education. But I don't think he does really touch on parenting very much at all and um i think he just just talks about education i don't know if anybody else who's who's read the book um uh, remembers anything but yeah i think he avoided parenting uh, why do you think well he wasn't a parent himself he did, apparently he never had kids um but obviously he would have seen the effect that the parents would have had on you know class after class that presumably he taught and I bet, you know, it's because it would have been a, an extremely volatile subject. No, I don't think that would be true. Ha, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, certainly, uh, certainly teachers um, can be pretty anxious about parents. Uh, I've certainly heard this from a number of teachers that they, you know, they can clearly see that parenting is, is the significant cause of the problem, but they can't bring anything up. And, and so that may have been something that he just, you know, whether you say wisely or courageously or discretion is the better part of valor, who knows, but it is something that he, um, he seems to have uh, avoided. And that's, that's always kind of tragic to me, uh, the, the missed opportunity, because I think that communicates itself to others very, like unconsciously, but very powerfully. Right. Right. I'm not sure. I, I think like you're a little bit harsh, Steph, because I mean that was like what 30 years ago. Um, uh, I think that for for his time, the, he was like like uh, Jake said, it was really consistent. At, at least when he applied this to education, of course, 
there was like a missed opportunity, but for what it's, uh, yeah, I, I think it was pretty good for its time. And you, you could be exactly right about the harshness. I mean, I'm certainly not going to argue with you on that. I certainly could be too harsh. But because he himself defines education as not a teacher-student thing fundamentally, then I think he would have to view the first educators of kids as, as parents, wouldn't he? Yeah, yeah, yes, of course. But, uh, you know, uh, the way I look at it, people have, like, a huge problem with looking at parenting, like, right now, today, so... I can only imagine what kind of resistance there, there would be in, 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 in his time. Well, that may be begging the question, right? Because if people like him had taken it on, it may not be so difficult. Well, it wouldn't be so difficult today, right? Yeah, I guess so. It's going to, it's going to be an evolution from, you know, where we are now to unschooling is such a, a long journey, especially if you consider, um, you know, what where most people stand as far as their attitudes uh, towards education are concerned. Uh, people like the building. You know, they like a place where the kid goes. And I think that before um, young people are really totally set free and, and uh, most people would be open to following the suggestions that, that Holt makes in this book and in other places, um, there, there needs to be some kind of transition to these, you know, at the very least, parent-run schools where um, you know, kids go and they interact. And I don't see it as a, as a jump that, that can be taken in any uh, meaningful way from, you know, the state that we're in today where over 90 percent of people are educated by the government. Uh, to a more free and open, child-centered form of education. So I definitely think that there there is an important transition. And really, I don't want to be overly practical about it, but I think it is something that's going to take time. I mean, certainly if I had my own children, that's how I would like to see education happen. Um, but, you know, another important point that Holt makes, you know, learning is doing. Like, education has this other definition and, you know, he's just talking about let people do stuff. You know, people want to learn. They don't need to be told how to learn. They want to and they, and they know how. Yes, I, I guess so you mean that at least even, even though there's a long way to go to get to sort of full unschooling, do you mean like that you can still apply some of the kind of doing approach, even maybe, you know, not necessarily in a fully unschooled way? Is that, is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah, and and I I, mean, I think that there's ways that that parents can even integrate these these ideas that Hope puts forward if their kids are in public school. I mean, there 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 are some people in situations where they are just trapped. They do, they do not have anything else to do uh, with their children during the day, and they they spend libertarians included, people here in New Hampshire included, and they and they find themselves rationalizing. Uh, public school, and they say, "Oh well, you know, I'll just uh, make sure that I undo whatever damage uh, when when the kid gets home." But but there is, yeah, there is a a, a long and winding road uh, between where we are and I think where education. I'd like to see people's attitudes towards education ultimately go, but it doesn't mean that we can't start uh, incorporating some of Holt's ideas in the interim. Yeah, I thought it was really. Uh... I thought it was great that he actually makes a suggestion in here as well for people who, whose kids are stuck in public education. And he'd like his basic suggestion was that um, just be honest with the kid that if it's a stupid game, you know, and if they're expected to, um, you know, parrot back, um, you know, these these things in 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 these classes, then just just be honest with the kid and help them to, um, you know, to, to do whatever it is they need to do to get through um, that, you know, stupid game, basically. And he, he even has, I can't remember exactly what it was, but he had, like, some suggestion about, um, you know, if you can get hold of the answers and, um, you know, make it, maybe you can make it fun to actually try and predict what it is that the teacher's going to, do from their teaching manual. Oh, well, that's it. He says he suggests get hold of the teaching manual and just make it transparent. Uh, help, help make it as transparent as possible for the kids. What it is that they're being sort of subjected to, because um, if it's you know very much that they will be essentially spoon-fed um, a bunch of um, you know conclusions, 
then mm-hmm. you, know, you can at least at least sort of um, the, help the child to um, effectively just cope with having to go through that rather you know, um, annoying and frustrating and uh, and tedious process. Yeah, I think you can you can certainly blow away a lot of the fog. And, um, you know, I, re- I really try to do this. I, I teach these SAT classes. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, persuasion, persuasive writing. And, you know, well, a lot of people think that the, the essay process uh, begins with a thesis. And, you know, I would say as far as the whole process is concerned, that's closer to the middle. The thesis is a conclusion that's, that, it, you know, sits on top of facts. So if you can point out uh, to especially, you know, you know, if you're realizing these things when you're uh, when your kids are in middle school or high school, yeah, they're being spoon fed uh, conclusions, especially in classes like civics or or, or history. Uh, start start saying, is that you know, is that just the capstone of a pyramid hovering around in midair with nothing underneath it, or or is that verifiable? Are there facts underneath it? Uh, you know, where did this story where did this story come from? And um, I think if young people can be taught how to make reasoned arguments, uh, then, yeah, they can see through a lot of, a lot of the BS that they're being fed in, in these schools. You know, it's sometimes, uh, in, my, in my career, a lot of the kids I worked with were in high school, and sometimes it felt like no matter what I could do, especially when I was a classroom teacher, it was, it was too late. There had been uh, too much damage done, but I don't think it's ever too late to start trying to correct that. Right. 